Chapter 53. So this chapter has to do with um, some pretty cool stuff. So you know when they say, oh, there's only a thousand polar bears left. How do they know that? So we're going to get into what goes into uh, a wildlife study and figuring out population counts and that type of thing. So there's a lot of things you need to take into account. You can't just go out and do a count and say, okay, there's 50 of them. That must mean there are 50 left in the world, right? So you need to think about the fact that they're dealing with a lot of things in the environment that might be affecting them. And so you have to take all that into consideration. So the first one could be a physiological thing. So um, organisms are going to do stuff internally to deal with their environments. And you did that when you moved here to Colorado, um, if you moved from sea level. So at sea level, you have less blood cells, that, uh, red blood cells, than up here. And that's to deal with the fact that there's less oxygen up here. So you physiologically made a change to the environment by creating more red blood cells to deal with less oxygen. So that'd be an example of a physiological change. Um, another way that organisms can adapt to the environment is morphologically. So those are going to be exterior changes. Um, shedding fur is a great example of that. Um, we had an Alaskan Malamute that we brought from Colorado down to Florida. We are bad people. And the second she got there, she just shed most of her fur because it was so hot and she needed to deal with the environment, right? So that's an example of a morphological one. Shedding antlers, that would be like a morphological one. Um, and this last one is going to be behavioral responses to changes in the environment. So if you think about it, there's a lot of things that organisms do when it gets cold. They can hibernate, they can fly south, they can burrow, they can do all sorts of things behaviorally like that. And the reason these are all important to think about is, let's say that we were doing a count on bears in Colorado and you decided to do it right now uh, in January. Um, if you're doing that and there's no bears, you were like, oh, God, they're all extinct. Well, that's not true. They're hibernating. So you need to know a lot about their responses to the environment before you just go out and do a count. Okay, so let's define a population. A population is going to be a group of individuals of one species that are occupying the same area. So when we're all in the classroom together, we're a population of humans because we're all in the same little area and we're using resources and things like that. Okay. So when you're doing counts on a population, you're totally doing it at the population level. You usually aren't going to have enough space or, you know, time to do like all of them that are out there. So one thing that you got to take into account is going to be what's called the density. <clears throat> and that's just saying like how many individuals there are per unit of area. For example, if I said there's 50 elephants per acre in this country or something like that. So the way that we can measure density, the most famous way, and we're actually going to do an activity on this, is going to be what's called mark and recapture. I bet you can guess what that entails. So you're going to catch organisms, you're going to mark them in some way, let them go, and then recapture them. <clears throat> now, the important thing about that is that you um, definitely need to use this equation, first of all, but you also need to make sure that the way you mark them is appropriate. Um, I've got a really, let's see if I can pull this up while I'm talking, but um, I've got a really good example of something that I did in undergrad that was probably not the best way to um, do a mark and recapture, and I'll show you why. So there's a lot of ways that you can mark organisms. One way is you could use um, a marker. You could literally use a Sharpie marker. You can use tags, which are like little earrings hanging off. You can, um, oh, let's see, where is it? Oh, I thought I had it. Um, so you can do all sorts of things like that, but I can show you in a, I thought I had it on here. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So this is from our next chapter, but here you can see a little crab here. Those are called ghost crabs, and I did a project on those. And for my mark and recapture, I took a big red Sharpie and put a big X on the ones that I'd caught. Um, and the weird thing was I did not recapture any of the ones with the red X. Can you imagine why? Yeah, so some predators were really happy with me that day. So that was not a good choice. Um, so you need to think that through. Same thing if you're doing birds, right? You don't want to put like some real heavy lead bracelet on them because then they can't fly. So things that are going to have the least impact on their behavior, um, ability to swim or fly and that type of stuff. Okay, so that's density. 
Then the next part is you need to look at dispersion patterns. Um, and that's going to be what type of spacing the individuals have between them. And there's different things that will cause those to happen. So there's clumped, uniform, and random. And I think this is easiest if I show you the pictures of them. So here you can see what is called clumped distribution. So they're in these little groups, and then there's a lot of space in between them. So here you can see these C stars are in a clumped distribution pattern. So the reason that they usually do this is because of some sort of attraction between individuals. It could be some sort of social aspect they have. It could be safety in numbers from predators. It could be a food source. That's most likely what's happening here. So when you clump, and we call that herding, flocking, schooling, all of that, anytime that happens, that's usually due to an attraction between individuals. Now, the next type is pretty cool, and that's going to be uniform. And so you can see that there's pretty much an exact amount of space between each individual that's uniform throughout the population. Penguins are notorious for doing this. Now, I want you to think about it, why that would happen. So if you look at these penguins, what do you think would happen if this guy moved a little bit closer to this guy? Most likely what's going to happen is this guy is going to peck at him and fight him because that's his territory. So uniform distribution patterns are usually going to be the result of some sort of repulsion between individuals. And so they are territories, or plants do it too. They're like garlic and onions are famous for doing this, where they will actually release chemicals into the, into the dirt that will kill anything around them so that they don't have anything competing with them. So uniform is going to be due to a repulsion. And then you've got random, and random is just wherever anything lays, it lays. And that's usually due to an absence of either attractions or repulsions. So why do we care about this? Well, once again, let's say we were doing a count on elephants. And um, I said, okay, I want to do uh, a count here and here and here. And I come back and say, there's no elephants. That's it. The elephants are extinct. Well, I'm totally wrong, right? Because I was in between clumps. So you have to think about that type of behavioral thing that they might be doing as well. Okay, back to your notes. So counting them is one thing, and that is a great thing to do. Another really important thing is going to be demographics. So even though you know that there's a thousand polar bears left, you need to know their ages. Now think about why that would be important. Well, I mean, at certain ages, they're going to be either too old or too young to reproduce and reestablish themselves as a population. So that's super important. So one thing you can do to better understand them is you can make what's called a life table. And the life table says, okay, um, ages 0 to 5, there's this many alive. Ages 5 to 10, there's this many alive. So it kind of organizes it. And then what you can also do from that is you can actually plot what's called a survivorship curve. And I have a picture of that. There. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So um, this is showing a survivorship curve right here. So what this shows you is that there are basically three curves that can happen. So this oyster here is going to follow a type 3 survivorship curve. And what that means is early on in life is when they have a high mortality rate. And if they make it to a certain age, then they kind of do a lot better in, in, later in life. So that's usually things that like spew out tons and tons of eggs and larvae and hope that a couple survive. Um, then you've got type 2, which is like this little prairie dog here, and that basically is showing that they have an even chance of survivorship throughout their entire lives. And then the type 1 is what humans are, and so what we do is we have a pretty awesome chance of survival early on in life, and it's only when we get to the end of our lifespan that we start dying off. So those are the three types of survivorship curves that we have. Okay. Now, another thing that's important are reproductive tables. And that would basically um, say how old something is when it's able to reproduce. Super important, once again, because that goes into regulations, right? You don't want people killing a whole bunch of babies that haven't had the time to reach maturity and replace themselves so that you know, you're not making the population go down. So reproductive tables are very important for that. And I should mention, how do we know how old an animal is? That's a tough thing to do. Um, you can't exactly, you know, I mean, on fish, sometimes you can look at this little bone in their ear that has, like, tree rings on it, but that's pretty invasive, and you're probably going to kill them doing that. 
So you obviously don't want to be doing that all the time. So the best way to figure out how old an animal is is usually by size. And so you can kind of do it by that. All right. Um, once again, we're going to talk about reproductive strategies here. And they're going to be a lot in between. It's a lot easier with a lot of these uh, nature types of things to talk about the extremes and then know that there's a lot of in between. So the first type, which has a lovely name when we talk about reproduction, is Big Bang Reproduction. It's also called Semilparity. And that's called one-time reproduction. So that's going to be an organism that puts all of its resources in its whole life into eventually reproducing one time and then they usually die afterwards. So this is going to happen in areas where climates are really harsh and they have to make sure that when the climate turns nice, they are ready to go. Um, so if you think about those flowers that only flower every hundred years, that type of thing. Then you've got repeated reproduction and repeated reproduction is also called iteroparity and that's a bunch of repeated reproduction events close together. Um, and that's usually because their offspring don't have a good survival rate. Think about cockroaches, mice, that type of thing. Um, so obviously there's an in-between there. I mean, I think humans find ourselves in between those two. But those are the extremes that we can talk about. So going along with that, populations are going to grow and they can also go down in numbers. They can decrease. And the way that you figure out if a population is growing is you just basically take the birth rate minus the death rate and that can tell you if it's growing or getting smaller. Now with that being said, there is something that a population will reach that's called the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is going to be that maximum amount that the population can get to before it starts having a die-off due to lack of resources or degradation of the environment or something like that. So if we look at this uh, next slide here, this has um, a graph of paramecium, which are a type of protist, that are in a petri dish in a lab. And what happens is when there's a lot of nutrients and everything, their populations just go out of control and they do this exponential growth that you're seeing here. And then all of a sudden it just levels off. And that's because they've reached their carrying capacity and they're running out of nutrients. And so it's going to do that. Now, the big question is, what about humans, right? We're at, what, 7 billion, somewhere around there? Um, when do we reach our carrying capacity? I mean, if we look at that definition, it says that when, um, you know, the population should start leveling off due to degradation of the environment. Hmm. So this graph keeps me up at night, the next one I'm going to show you. Holy crap. All right, so this is a graph of the human population over time. Oh, there's a little blip with the plague, and then holy Moses, it just goes straight up. So a couple of things that gave rise to that were going to be the Industrial Revolution, medical advances, and that type of thing. But we are climbing really fast. We're starting to kind of tilt over a little bit, but that's not anything that's, you know, crazy good or anything like that. So a lot of people are speculating, what is our carrying capacity? Have we passed our carrying capacity? Because there are some populations that don't just level off, they'll overshoot it and then they go way down and then they kind of level off. We could be that type of population. We'll just have to see. So that'll keep you up at night, or at least it keeps me up at night. Okay, now the last part here is talking about population growth rates and life history models. And once again, we're gonna talk about two extremes. So there's what's called K-selected and then R-selected. K-selected populations are gonna be ones that have a later reproductive age longer lifespan, um, and few offspring, and extensive parental care. So the example that I give, they're whales, humans, and coconut palms. And I know some of you are thinking, coconut palms? Like, how do they have parental care? Well, obviously, for plants, you're going to tweak that a little bit. But if you think about a coconut palm, they're putting all that energy into, like, you know, three, four, five coconuts. Whereas if you think about a dandelion, that's putting, like, a little bit of energy into having thousands of seeds, right? So think about case-selected populations. They're going to do really well when the population is near the carrying capacity just because they don't have a lot of offspring, so their populations normally shouldn't grow that out of control. Now, the only thing about case-selected that's bad is it's very hard if their population is dwindling to get their population back just because it takes them so long to reproduce, and then when they finally do, they only produce like one or two or a very low number at a time. Um, then on the other end of that, we have our R-selected populations. 
our selected populations are going to have a very early reproductive age. So like right out of the womb, they're reproducing. Shorter lifespan, maturation time is shorter, lots and lots of offspring, and little to no parental care. Examples would be mice, cockroaches, dandelions, those types of things. And these populations are going to do really well when the population is way below the carrying capacity because they can bring it up to the carrying capacity really quickly. So those are going to be the extremes in a couple of examples there. Like I said, 53 is a pretty short chapter, but we are going to do a mark and recapture activity to kind of go over how that works.